today, uh, we're going to start a new lesson. It's been, been a while since we started a new lesson. Uh, I, I won't say that this lesson is particularly cheery. Um, we, we get to deal with the fall of Babylon, so, so that's pretty cool, uh, and, and what Babylon resents, so, represents. So we'll be talking about that. A lot of questions in this particular study. So uh, we'll be in chapters 17 and 18. Uh, but before we do that, we should have our prayer. And in our prayer, uh, we'll have mentioned the, uh, the gospel reading from this last Sunday. Does anybody remember the gospel reading from Sunday? I know, it's, it's hard when you have a service in between. I think it was the same one that we had Emmanuel in uh, Spirit Lake, because I noticed, okay, we're on the same thing. First Sunday in Lent, I think the, the gospel would be the same. The Old Testament is different, but the, the, the gospel, I think, is more or less the same. Uh, it has something to do with Jesus. Something to do with Jesus, something at the beginning of his ministry, something to do with Jesus and the devil. Oh, was that when in 40 days? Yeah, the temptation of Jesus in the wilderness. <clears throat> yep, yep, so that's going to be coming up in the prayer here, uh, talking about how the devil also, also seeks us. So, let us pray. Lord God, Heavenly Father, we beseech you that whereas the wicked enemy constantly stalks us, and as a roaring lion walks around seeking whom he may devour, you would, for the sake of Christ your Son, come to our aid, and by your word strengthen our hearts, that the foe may not overpower us, but that we may abide in your grace eternally, and at last obtain salvation. Through the same Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. All right, so we are on a new lesson, so cherish this because it won't happen again for a while. Right. Yeah, and, you know, on any text, there's really, you know, several ways to preach on it. And, you know, sometimes when I've preached on the temptation of Jesus, yeah, we've, we can see in him uh, this example of, of what should I do, you know, what is one thing I should do when I'm faced with temptation, and, and, and one is to turn to God's word, you know, uh, resist the devil and he will flee from you, you know, Peter says, um, and I think that's good and useful, and we should talk about that, but we should also be aware that we're not Jesus. Uh, and uh, sometimes we resist the devil, and we're going to fail anyway, because we're sinners to begin with. Um, but when we're faced with temptation, yes, we should uh, avail ourselves of, of God's word, of, of prayer, of singing a hymn, you know, the, these sorts of things. So there is something to learn from that. And, and also, like, uh, I think this is something you mentioned, that, Jesus is God, and he still turned to God's word when he was troubled. And he still turned to, God, to, to the word when he was troubled, right? Uh, and uh, that sometimes when I, when I visit with people, I'll ask where their Bible is, and they can't tell me, you know, or, or, they, or they've long since lost it, you know, that, that sort of thing. And it's like, well, how, how do you deal with temptation? How do you deal with affliction in, in your life? You know, it, it, it seems to not be turning to the Bible, what is it that you're turning to, uh, you know, and things like that. So there is that example defined in Jesus. Um, and, and I think that one of maybe the mistakes we make with that text is then to assume that this is the only time that Jesus is tempted. You know, I, I don't think that's, that's a correct. I think that the, the temptation is maybe this kind of this peak of, of, of activity between the devil and him, but certainly the temptations continue throughout Jesus' ministry and, and even beforehand. Um, so, I, so I think that's something to bear in mind that Jesus' resisting of temptation was not just there, but, but throughout his life. You know, um, if you've seen The Passion, uh, you know, it, it takes some liberties in, in a few places because of its Roman Catholic kind of backing, but uh, that's how they portray Jesus in the Garden of Gethsemane is that the devil is there, you know, irritating him and tempting him there in the garden, you know. Uh, and so I thought that was interesting and, and well done. And he was fully human. The devil or Jesus. For sin. 
Yes, Jesus, yep. And we are tempted constantly, daily. Yeah. You know, all the people that came and bugged him, the temptation to, to say something mm -hmm. that he did not say, I think the temptation was there and he battled it with Yeah. Well, and particularly like the Pharisees, like dealing with the Pharisees, like, you know, the temptation to be irritated with these people, you know, and irritated in a sinful way, you know, uh, that Jesus didn't. So that that's kind of befuddles us. Karen, you look like you, you had your hand going up there for a second. Yeah. I was just thinking about the patience. Yeah. His patience, uh, such an example mm -hmm. of patience. Yeah. Yeah. Are you still unbelieving? Or in my translation, are you so thick? You know? Yeah, yeah. But the patience that he exhibits, I don't have. Yeah. But you pray for patience, and then that gives you things to create patience. So I pray for strength mm. these days. Mm. Just get uh, patience yeah. hard for me. Yeah, and the disciples too, like, I think there's a couple occasions where Jesus is, is strained by the disciples. Uh, the, the one, I think, is when the, the man brought his son who was oppressed by the demon to the disciples and they, they couldn't cast out the demon. So then he brings him to Jesus and Jesus is like, faithless generation, how long am I to bear with you? And, and, I, and I think that's maybe talking about the disciples. Uh, but then also later on, when they're talking about, Jesus is teaching them, beware of the leaven of the Pharisees. And what do the disciples start thinking about? You remember this? Uh, Jesus is telling them about the, the, the Pharisees and the Sadducees, and he tells them to beware of the leaven of the Pharisees and the Sadducees. And then the evangelist tells us the disciples realized they hadn't brought any bread, and so they thought Jesus was warning them to don't, don't get any bread from those Pharisees. And Jesus is like, why don't you guys get what I'm talking about? You know, have you been with me for this three years? But, uh, but he does so without sin. So I think patience, yes, patience and uh, the, uh, the word in Greek is uh, a connected word, uh, is macrothumia, not macrome, macrothumia, and it means long-suffering, you know, being uh, willing to put up with others, uh, you know, patiently, you know, and this, this is a word that is commonly used for God. Uh, but it is also a fruit of the Spirit. Uh, this Thumia. Macrothumia. Macrothumia, yep. Thumia. If I had a board, I would write it out for you. Uh, but that's, that's what that word means. Uh, and oftentimes in Scripture, our, when our English translation puts it as patient, that's the word behind it. It's patience, but it's really more. It's, it's putting up with the, the foibles and the idiosyncrasies and the sins of others, and it's particularly how God is disposed towards us, long-suffering, right? Uh, well, then a detached in judgment. You know, you're not supposed to judge, but we do. Yeah. Lack of patience. Yeah, I, yeah lack of patience is sometimes uh, shown in, in rush to judgment, right? You know, uh, and... Which is, which is bad. Right, right. Except, you know, the judgment and the discernment. Mm-hmm, <coughs> right. Know? Mm -hmm. yeah. It's a complicated life. Yeah. Well, it's, and it's funny how, like, we're so easy to, it's so easy for us to rush to judgment on others, but then on ourselves, we want unlimited patience. Right? Right. Isn't that exactly how it works? Like, we're so quick to judge the sins of other people, but we do not want that treatment toward ourselves. Right? You know, instead, we want unlimited leeway to, to do whatever we want and have nobody ever call us to the carpet for anything, but we are so quick to do that for others, right? Uh, well, we have that with raising children. Mm -hmm. That's it. Keep them with enough time. Mm -hmm. now, now we have to deal with it. Yeah. Well, and raising children is... I mean, that's an art anyway, and it's, it's an endless exercise in patience, you know, and, uh, yeah, and, and a blessing, 
You know, we, uh, I, Gideon sits, we have this high chair that, that comes apart and the, the, uh, the top part becomes booster seat, right? And, and so for a while we've been using that with, with Gideon. But we need to transition him out of it to make space for eventually for when Nikolai is going to need it in like two months from now. Um, however, the problem is Gideon cannot sit still at any moment ever. Uh, and especially at mealtime when Nikolai is on a cushion on the floor next to him. He, he, can't, he can't sit. He's got to like lay on the chair and poke at his brother and spill food all over the place and things like this. So, so then, you know, how many times do I have to ask him to sit up and sit up and sit up and sit at the table? And, and you know, just every single meal I have to you know, do this. And so eventually I have to go get the high chair out and strap him in. And, uh, yeah, well, this morning he got to go, he got to go hungry, so, uh, so he's going to be pretty hungry until snack time at preschool, but uh, anyway, that patience, you know, is a good thing to pray for. He did, to, due to the uh, masterful work of, of, of Becky, because I could see that she was trying to distract him with, you know, with the, the bags that we have, so. He, he was, uh, and he also, you maybe couldn't hear him, but I could from up here, uh, when we got to the Lord's Prayer, he was praying the Lord's Prayer very well. Um, so he does that pretty well. Yes, and there are some parts of, uh, even in the Vesper service, um, oh, when we were doing the song, mm-hmm. you know, and you have a good friend in the church, mm-hmm. and then um, I think it was Bob and John that jumped in, yeah, and sorry. Can you lift your voice? Yeah. <laughs> Slow your roll, <laughs> sir. Yeah. Yeah. And he uh he has different he has favorite parts of the litur- of the liturgy that different times he uh he'll have different favorite parts. So for a long time he liked the offertory creating me a clean heart. For, uh, for a long time he liked Oh Christ thou Lamb of God. He would walk around the house saying, Oh Christ thou Lamb of God and uh lately it's been Alleluia, Lord, to whom shall we go? So you'll hear him dancing around, you know, singing this, you know. And, uh, uh, but lately, he's changed it to, uh, you have the words of eternal life, to you need the words of eternal life. And it's like, well, you need the words of eternal life, Gideon, but, you know, I can't convince him that that's, you know, not how it actually goes. We play, we play church all the time. Mm-hmm. 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 All right, we should probably get to, we're never going to start this new lesson if we don't uh, start it now. So we are going to be in Revelation chapter 17, uh, where we talk about the fall of Babylon. Uh, I know, and it's taken us about a year to get this far, so who knows? Do the math, how long it'll take us to finish. All right, now twice before, so we, way back we talked about how there's these cycles in Revelation, these cycles of visions, and I think there's three of them. And so twice before it says, in his visions, John has been assured of the destruction of Babylon the Great. So that was back in chapter 14, uh, and then in chapter 16, and it says that this section concentrates on that destruction. So the destruction of Babylon. So we're going to go to chapter 17, and we're going to read the whole chapter. All right. It says, Then one of the seven angels who had the seven bowls came and said to me, Come, I will show you the judgment of the great prostitute who is seated on many waters, with whom the kings of the earth have committed sexual immorality, and with the wine of whose sexual immorality the dwellers on earth have become drunk. And he carried me away in the spirit into a wilderness, and I saw a woman sitting on a scarlet beast that was full of blasphemous names, and it had seven heads and ten horns. The woman was arrayed in purple and scarlet, 
and adorned with gold and jewels and pearls, holding in her hand a golden cup full of abominations and the impurities of her sexual immorality. And on her forehead was written a name of mystery, Babylon the Great, mother of prostitutes and of earth's abominations. And I saw the woman drunk with the blood of the saints, the blood of the martyrs of Jesus. When I saw her, I marveled greatly. But the angel said to me, Why do you marvel? I will tell you the mystery of the woman and of the beast with seven heads and ten horns that carries her. The beast that you saw was and is not and is about to rise from the bottomless pit and go to destruction. And the dwellers on earth whose names have not been written in the book of life from the foundation of the world will marvel to see the beast because it was and is not and is to come. This calls for a mind with wisdom. The seven heads are seven mountains on which the woman is seated. They are also seven kings, five of whom have fallen. One is, the other has not yet come. And when he does come, he must remain only a little while. As for the beast that was and is not, it is an eighth, but it belongs to the seven, and it goes to destruction." And the ten horns that you saw are ten kings who have not yet received royal power, but they are to receive authority as kings for one hour together with the beast. These are of one mind, and they hand over their power and authority to the beast. They will make war on the lamb, and the lamb will conquer them, for he is Lord of lords and king of kings, and those with him are called and chosen and faithful." And the angel said to me, The waters that you saw, where where the prostitute is seated, are peoples and multitudes and nations and languages. And the ten horns that you saw, they and the beast will hate the prostitute. They will make her desolate and naked and devour her flesh and burn her up with fire. For God has put it into their hearts to carry out his purpose by being of one mind and handing over their royal power to the beast until the words of God are fulfilled. And the woman that you saw is the great city that has dominion over the kings of the earth. That's, it's, about as, it's about as clear as mud, huh, you know. Uh, I, like, I like verse 17. For me, that, that's got to be still in control. Well, yes, and we'll, we'll get to that in, in a little bit. Um, Basically, what's going to happen is this woman uh, is, who rides on the beast is going to get betrayed by the beast. And the beast is going to destroy the, the woman. Uh, so uh, this is what happens. Like, uh, See, I've been reading Lord of the Rings uh, when I've been feeding Nikolai in the middle of the night. And so... Uh, it kind of all gets in my head. And uh, in, in the Lord of the Rings, you have the big bad guy. His name is Sauron. Uh, and, and then you have this one wizard who used to be a good guy, uh, but now is a bad guy, and his name is Sauron. Uh, and they are competing with each other to, to rule the world, right? And, uh, and so at one point, one of the main characters of the book talks about, well, this is the nature of evil, is that those who are evil are also evil to each other, uh, and so, so evil just consumes itself, right? Uh, and so what that verse is talking about is, is eventually this, this woman who is riding on the beast, eventually the beast is going to more or less kick her off and destroy her, you know, uh, she who formerly held, held sway above the beast. Uh, but we'll come back to that in a little bit because uh, we have a lot going on between here and there. So it says here, but you are right, Rhoda, yes, that God is in control. Uh, you are correct about that. Well, I was going to hang on to that one of these. <laughs> I knew I was right all along anyway. You know, this is true. Uh, and this is also like, um, like I said in my sermon last night, and, and common that we, we talk about this, that God is able to work through affliction or or 
God is able to turn evil to his own good purposes. Um, so a, a big example of this would be God punished Jerusalem with Babylon. God used Babylon to punish Jerusalem. But then God used Persia to punish Babylon. You know, that, that God is able to, to use these bad things even for his, his good purposes. Uh, and, and the chief expression of that, of course, is the cross. Uh, but let's come into this. So it says, An angel holding one of the seven censers tells John that he will be shown the punishment of the great prostitute who sits on many waters. The reference to many waters is an allusion to the city of Babylon, which sat on the banks of the Euphrates and had many canals. Uh, so, for example, Babylon is described pretty much this way in Jeremiah 51, verse 13. Uh, but before John actually sees her punishment, which is what we just read at the end of the chapter, he is shown more about her and about the beast on which she sits. Uh, so here in chapter 17, we first have this question about, about Babylon herself, I guess. Uh, and here in verse 1, she's called a prostitute. Now, uh, why do you suspect, the question says, why is Babylon called a prostitute? Might have to look at, uh, you know, verse two in particular. Doesn't uh, why is she called a prostitute? Yes. Mm-hmm. Well, for one, she herself is immoral, but is she alone immoral? Who else is involved in this in verse 2? The kings of the earth, all the dwellers of the earth have become drunk with her sexual immorality. right? So Babylon, in, in this part of the vision, is referred to as a prostitute because uh, she commits adultery and then she also brings others into it with her, in particular, the, the kings of the earth and then all of the, the unbelievers on the earth, the ones whose names are not written in the book of life. Uh, so for this reason, she's pictured uh, as, as a prostitute. Uh, now, the next question then is, what is meant by this adultery or, or sexual immorality? So maybe we could go to the Jeremiah text. Um, the Ezekiel text is a little long. That one's good, too. Uh, but let's go to Jeremiah. Jeremiah comes after Isaiah. Chapter 3. Verses 6 through 10. Let's see. The Lord said to me in the days of King Josiah, this is a Jeremiah, Have you seen what she did? That faithless one, Israel. How she went up on every high hill and under every green tree and there played the whore. And I thought, after she has done all this, she will return to me. But she did not return. And her treacherous sister Judah saw it. She saw that for all the adulteries of that faithless one, Israel, I had sent her away with a decree of divorce. Yet her treacherous sister Judah did not fear. But she too went and played the whore. Because she took her whoredom lightly, she polluted the land, committing adultery with stone and tree. Yet for all this, her treacherous sister Judah did not return to me with her whole heart, but in pretense, declares the Lord. Right? Uh, so 
here we can see that we're, we're not necessarily talking about uh, sexual immorality per se, although this will be, be included in that. But here, uh, God is using the imagery of, of unfaithfulness uh, to talk about what? What, what was it that, that Israel and, and Judah did? Yeah, they had idols, right? They committed idolatry. If you look at verse 10 or verse 9, that she committed adultery with stone and tree. So what were, what were the idols made of? They were made of stone and, and, and wood, right? Uh, that throughout the Old Testament, God's relationship with his people is commonly pictured as a, as a bridegroom and bride. You know, that happens in the New Testament too, right? Uh, and then idolatry is, is often then portrayed as, as adultery, that, that Israel and Judah are the bride of God, and by their idolatry, they have been unfaithful to, to their husband, right? Uh, but not only idolatry. If we were to look at the Ezekiel text, it's, it's pretty much the same thing, but just a little bit longer. Um, another way that Israel was adulterous in the Old Testament is that they often trusted in other otherworldly powers, right? Uh, so one example would be Egypt. Uh, they often sought help from, from Egypt. Um, and I forget whether that was with the Babylonians uh, or with the Assyrians, where uh, Israel looked like they were in trouble, so instead of trusting in God, they reached out to Egypt uh, and then what happened is Egypt lost in battle, and then Israel lost in battle. Uh, they trusted in Egypt. Uh, at some time, they trusted in Syria uh, or even in Babylon. And Hezekiah, good Hezekiah, is even guilty of this. Because when Hezekiah was king, and Hezekiah reigned uh, about 100 years before the fall of Jerusalem, some envoys from Babylon came, and Hezekiah received them, and he, he showed them around, and he brought them into the temple and showed them all the gold and all that, and he even sent the Babylonians back with some gold to kind of like, you know, stay their wrath. And then God said, you know, Hezekiah, all that stuff that you showed the Babylonians, they're, they're, they're going to come and take. You know, he's like, nevertheless, but because you are still a faithful king, this will be after you die, but you did wrong by trying to appease the Babylonians there, Hezekiah, right? Um, right? So Israel was adulterous, you know, not only in their idolatry, but also then in their trust in, in, in foreign powers. Uh, and, and then from there, we can step down to, uh, yeah, then it does not inf- include all sorts of immoral living, right? So uh, this word here in, uh, in Revelation for sexual immorality is, is porneia. Uh, that's the Greek word. Um, and we're going to hear this again on Sunday in the epistle reading, uh, where St. Paul says, uh, this is the will of God, your sanctification, uh, that you abstain from sexual immorality. Uh, and, and that word includes all forms of, of really immoral sexual living. Um, you know, but this also extends out to... Uh, you know, Israel, when they committed idolatry, you know, they didn't just worship idols. They also took on all the practices that go with that. So, so sexual immorality, but also uh, cheating their neighbor and all sorts of, you know, murder and strife, like, you know, that all goes with it. So Babylon is called a prostitute because she herself commits adultery. She entices others. And by this idolatry, we mean idolatry, trust in things that aren't God, and then all forms of just immoral and unfaithful living. Uh, right? Now, who, this is question 198, who commits adultery with this prostitute? This is verse 2, back in Revelation 17. Who gets wrapped up with this... Uh, Babylon here. We said it already. Kings of the earth and who else? General unbelievers. 
We have uh, the kings of the earth and the dwellers on earth, you know, uh, all the people whose names are not written in the book of life. All right, so the, in particular, the rulers of the earth uh, get wrapped up with this beast, but then also the unbelievers of the world. You know, they all get wrapped up in this uh, game with this prostitute Babylon, you know, whether uh, directly in idolatry or in trust in things that aren't God or in all the various forms of immoral living, you know, whether sexual immorality in particular, but also there are other ways of living immorally, right? Uh, so this, this prostitute holds great sway over all the earth, uh, and she's called Babylon. But here for a moment, we will talk about Babylon. And it says, the historical city of Babylon was located on the banks of the Euphrates River. It was the center of a great empire that around 600 BC ruled most of the ancient Near East from the Persian Gulf to the Mediterranean Sea. Babylon was used by God to discipline his people for their unfaithfulness to him in 605 BC and again in 597 Babylon invaded Judah and carried some of its residents back to the area around Babylon. So uh, a name that we would recognize that got kind of caught up in that would be Ezekiel. Uh, so if you read the book of Ezekiel, um, Ezekiel and Jeremiah were more or less contemporaries. Uh, the difference is Jeremiah remained in Jerusalem, but Ezekiel got carried off to Babylon. Uh, so his, his ministry is to the people who are already over there in exile, whereas Jeremiah is back saying, it's not over yet, right? Uh, so they took two ways, but then finally, in 586, Nebuchadnezzar, the great Babylonian king, destroyed the city of Jerusalem, including the temple of God, and carried even more exiles into captivity, Right? Uh, and uh, when we went to England, uh, Faith and I, for our fifth anniversary, we went to the British Museum, uh, and they have this cylinder, uh, you know, which was a, a way of keeping historical records. Uh, and this cylinder was commissioned by Nebuchadnezzar, and he and on it he talks about kicking Jerusalem's butt and destroying the whole place, and, and ransacking it, and taking, every, taking all these people back. So it's like, like really cool, and it's, and it's only like this big, but it's like, oh, that's interesting. I read about that in the Bible. Is that yeah. yeah, I have a picture of it that I, I could show you, but it's on my phone right now. You know, and, and of course, it's in, I forget, it must be in Babylonian. It's not in any language that I could read, but uh, it's been translated, and that's, that's what it says. It's Nebuchadnezzar's account of going to Jerusalem and conquering it. Uh, so that's pretty cool. Uh, anyway says, the people were deported to a pagan land where they were always tempted to participate in pagan worship and sometimes were threatened with force if they did not do so. So Daniel 3 is Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. What was it that led to their being thrown into the, the fiery furnace? Into an idol, right? Whenever they heard the sound, the, the pipes, the trigon, you know, all that kind of stuff, they were supposed to down and bow down and worship. Same thing that happened with Daniel later, uh, where uh, there was a law that was decreed that uh, nobody could pray to anybody uh, but, ne but to Nebuchadnezzar or in Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego's case, I think it was an idol. Um, and they didn't do that, so they got to go into the furnace. But they lived. Yep, that was pretty cool. The terror and the shame of the Babylonian exile made it a powerful image in the minds of God's people for centuries to follow. It is e I hear people outside. It is easy to see why Babylon is a powerful symbol of the enemies of God's people. In the years before the exile, God sent prophets to warn his people of their impending doom and call them to repentance. Jeremiah, for one, Isaiah, even way before that. Um, you have uh, even Micah and things like that. Uh, even as God's prophets were prophesying that Judah would be taken captive by Babylon, they were also prophesying the destruction of Babylon. 
So Isaiah 21, for example, uh, talks about Babylon and how it's going to be destroyed, Jeremiah as well. Babylon was crushed by Cyrus the Persian in 539. Cyrus then encouraged the people of Judah to return to their land and rebuild their temple. Just as the faithful people of God in the Old Testament looked forward to and rejoiced in the coming destruction of Babylon, so God's faithful people in the New Testament era can look forward to and rejoice in the ultimate destruction of all God's enemies. There have been numerous attempts to specifically identify the Babylon of which John wrote. Certainly in John's day, the powerful, arrogant, pagan Roman Empire, which set itself in the place of God and at times persecuted God's people, was an embodiment of Babylon. But in every age, God's people face such enemies, right? Uh, so that's a reference to how when John is writing this, Babylon's been, Babylon's been long gone, right? Uh, Babylon does not exist anymore in John's time. So, you know, what does he mean by, by Babylon here? And, uh, you know, there have been various attempts to specify that this is Rome, you know, specifically, but, uh, you know, they don't all hold water, that this is Rome exclusively. Uh, but Rome is mentioned as Babylon elsewhere. I think John also talks about uh, it, in his second or third epistle, she who is in Babylon greets you, uh, or maybe that's Peter that writes that way too. Uh, but Babylon then becomes this, uh, I guess, prototype for all of the, the enemies of God and, and of his people. Uh, so we have a question here. So this prostitute, she entices people uh, into, to join in her immorality. It says, what is the condition of the inhabitants of the earth uh, in the start of chapter 17? There's a word at the end of, end of verse 2. They're drunk. Yeah. Can you guys hear the shouting? Well, hopefully it ends. Yeah, it sounded like it was over here for a little bit. This house, I thought, had sold. It says sold out there, so I'm just hoping it, it uh, does not turn into anything else. All right. Uh, so the, the people of the world um, are described as, as drunk, and, and by people we mean these, these unbelievers. And, and so then what does it mean uh, what does this condition symbolize, it says? So this, uh, we're, you know, this sexual immorality, you know, it involves idolatry, trust in things that aren't God. Of course, it then does involve, it includes, you know, actual sexual immorality. Uh, these people of the world are, are drunk. What does that mean? Yeah, yeah, you're on the right track here. Um, you know, that the people of this world blind. Yeah, are, are blind, say, to their, their spiritual condition. That, that this being drunk with these abominations of Babylon means that they are, are caught up in these all sorts of forms of immoral and, and unbelieving life. Uh, that they are... Uh, kind of stuck in, in, in this way of living and are perhaps indifferent to, to other ways of, of living, such as, you know, the life of faith, uh, that they are totally caught up in, uh, say, the unbelieving life in, in whatever various form that takes, you know, whether it's uh, an actual drunkenness and sexual immorality or, um, you know, this would also apply to the people who are Good, upstanding, moral people who, who, who give to various charities and things like this, but don't believe in Jesus. You know, this, this would also include, include them, you know, uh, because everyone trusts in something, and it's either in Jesus or it's something else. Uh, and that something else can be whatever, right? Uh, right, 
Right. So, so this would include also these, these virtuous people uh, who, who are still yet unbelievers. Right? They, have, they have bought into the life of this world. Right? So that's what this, this drunkenness symbolizes. Now, this, this prostitute Babylon is pictured as uh, you know, very attractive, very alluring. What, what is it about this prostitute that, that makes her so, so alluring? And it has a couple of verses that we can, we can look at. Uh, Yeah, what, what colors does she wear? The purple and the scarlet. Yeah, she wears... And gold and jewels. Yeah. In very expensive Yeah, purple, you know, often uh, denoting uh, wealthiness uh, and luxury. Um, and in the Roman Empire, scarlet would, it would employ probably like royalty as well. Uh, she's clothed in, in jewels and, and, and gold and pearls. Uh, if you look at, at chapter eight, 18, excuse me, and if you just scan those verses, um, you know, she also uses these to, to attract people, but then also shares this wealth with, with the people who are, you know, brought into her web. You know, so after Babylon is destroyed, all the merchants of the earth are going to weep and cry because, you know, uh, they have all this cargo that was bestowed on them through their relationship with Babylon of gold and silver and jewels and pearls and fine linen and purple cloth and silk. And, you know, this, this prostitute draws people in with her, her attractive appearance and then also the wealth that she can share with those who are, are engaged with her, right? Uh, so this makes her attractive, you know, uh, the... For this reason, if you read through the epistles, particularly Peter, the first Peter, where he talked about how women uh, shouldn't adorn themselves with gold and precious jewels, you know, but you know, basically with humility and, and love and things like this. You know, and that was kind of a distinction between, well, who dresses with gold and pearls at that time? What will the, the pagan Romans do? Right? Uh, you know, yeah. Yeah, somewhat, yeah, yeah, and uh, you know, especially then in the New Testament era, there there really is an emphasis, particularly for women, but I, I would say men can sometimes be included in this on plain dress. You know, uh, the Amish do this, you know, and uh, and the Mennonites too, and they aren't entirely wrong, you know, for for the you know that idea of you know being you know let your adornments you know be out of the heart and, and, and not with the, the jewels that you wear, you know. doesn't mean all jewelry is wrong, you know. That, that, that would be an incorrect read of the text. Uh, but this is what the, the prostitute used to, uses to draw people in, the promises of, of luxury, of wealth, of splendor, of, of worldly happiness, you know, according to the flesh, and, and people go for it, you know, because uh, who doesn't like to be happy? Who doesn't like to have money and, and wealth and... Uh, business and all these things. So, so the world gets caught up into this, right? Uh, but in her hand, it says, the prostitute holds a golden cup from which she offers her lovers the wine that intoxicates them. And it says, what is the true nature of the contents of this cup? Yeah, very. This is why I said this is a very cheery lesson. Silver ones. You know, okay. So the actual prostitutes in this case have their pimps. They have the money and things that are offered to the prostitutes. Okay. Eventually, we're going to bring Satan into this, you know, because we haven't talked about, like, so Babylon here, we've already heard about this Babylon just by a different name. Uh, so if we went back to, like, Revelation 13, uh, there are these two beasts. 
Uh, and the one beast represents kind of like worldly government uh, of all forms that is opposed to, to Christ. You know, that, that come and go. When that's, that's this language in chapter 17 of this beast that, that was and is not and is to come. You know, and these kings, like, this is all a reference to this, this same beast. The beast here is the beast. Uh, but the harlot, this prostitute, this is the other beast from chapter 13, the one that looks like a lamb, but when it speaks, it has the voice of the dragon. Right, that, they, that these two beasts earlier from Revelation, one just stays as the beast. The, the, uh, the worldly powers as they're opposed to Christ, that one just stays the beast. But the, we'll say the, the religious beast, uh, from whom comes the Antichrist, this one changes forms. Uh, so before, it looked like, a, looked like a, a lamb, but spoke like a dragon. And then now, it's expedient that it looks like it looks like an upstanding woman, well-dressed upstanding woman. Uh, we have heard about another woman in Revelation in chapter 12. So if you go back to chapter 12, there's this talk about this, this woman. And uh, yes, and us and the Roman Catholics differ on who this woman is because we talked about this. Uh, they would say that the woman in chapter 12 is Mary, uh, but you know, the correct answer is that this, this woman in chapter 12 represents the church, uh, represents the, the body of Christ here on earth. The, this woman is the church. Uh, and so now, before the, uh, the prostitute appeared in form as a lamb, you know, kind of aping Christ, and now in chapter 17... This, uh, you know, religious beast now has it as its appearance the church, that outwardly it's going to look like the church. It's going to look like the church. That, that's, that's what we're dealing with here. And so then you can kind of put the circles together of why historically in Lutheranism we have talked about the Pope and, and the Roman Catholic Church as, you know, being opposed to Christ uh, and, and his, his true teaching. Uh, so this, this prostitute is kind of aping the, the appearance of the church. And ultimately how we got to this is, uh, you know, above this, this prostitute in chapter 17 is, is the same as in chapter 13 is, is the devil, right? Uh, that he is operating through these worldly governments and then through this religious beast of a variety of forms. And so what this Babylon represents is... Um, you know, kind of trying to push Christ out of the lives of people, whether by, by false Christianity, you know, false forms of Christianity, um, or by other forms, of, I guess, of spirituality that, that claim to offer eternal life but aren't from Christ, right? Uh, and in particular, as, as Revelation goes on, we're going to see that this... This harlot specifically takes aim at the church. Uh, that uh, she's specifically going to, to be, to appear to others as the true form of Christianity in contrast to, to the true faith. Right. So, Pam, you look like you have several thoughts. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Well, yeah, and like look at kind of the expression of Christianity um, in our country uh, is very much pretty much do whatever you want, come to church and, and love and do whatever you want, but there's never really any talk of like repentance or the forgiveness of sins. It's really tolerance and, and love. And anybody who does not toe that line is then viewed as not Christian, right? So if you, if you do not embrace any and all actions that anybody dares to take because they feel like it, you are, you are not Christian, right? So this is kind of an expression of, of this, this babble on the prostitute because that's trying to become 
the true church, you know, and, and, and many people are, are caught up into it, right? Um, you know, or, uh, you know, at, t- at one time, that would have been like Roman Catholicism, or like they would say, like, this is, this is the true church, and anybody who is not part of this church is not Christian, right? Uh, you know, we'd say, well, what about all the Greeks and, and all, all the Christians around the world who are not in fellowship with the Pope, you know, that sort of thing. And, and they would say, nope, you guys are all going to hell. You know? So it, ta- it, it morphs over time, you know, for whatever form is expedient to it, you know. And in, in our time, it's this idea of pretty much do whatever you want, you know. But if you go back to the time of the judges, you know, that, that says that explicitly, that everyone did whatever was right in their own minds, you know. They, they, just, they just did whatever they wanted. Right, uh, and so yeah, you're you're right, Pam. This kind of is a, a sto- story that is living out in in our own lives, right? Uh, and I've said that in sermons too. Like, and even last night, um, I mean, maybe not. Well, you guys have probably received some of this, and, and I have too. Of like, you know, whenever like anybody finds out what sort of Lutheran I am, you know. They're they're fine you know, with me being a Lutheran, but but then but then you start well I'm 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 a pastor with the Lutheran Church of Missouri Synod and then you kind of go oh, that's what I'm dealing with here, right? And just that subtle I mean the 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 trendy term for that that is microaggression, right? Like it's they they I've they've already got me pegged right when I said a Missouri Synod like oh I already know those guys those guys are going to hell that sort of thing you know those aren't the true Christians, yeah. Yeah, and and yeah, and I guess I wonder where that co- sometimes it comes from. Like, there are times where people have been legitimately uh, treated in sinful ways uh, because we're sinners, and we, and we do that. There, there are people who have have been legitimately mistreated by by Christians, and they may, and they maybe perceive that as as something that's wrong with a whole church body. And I, and I don't know if that's the correct, but that's what they do. Um, but then there are sometimes where people are opposed to. You know, say the Missouri Synod or Roman Catholicism or you know, uh, so-called conservative Christianity, because we talk about sin and repentance and then also forgiveness, but you know they you know they kind of don't want that. So there is some of that opposition, you know, and and it is really sad. Like, you know, when I do come across people who have been, you know, they have been wronged by somebody, and 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 now in their minds the whole Missouri Synod is terrible and evil, and say, well. Surely you don't mean that that everybody in the Missouri Synod is unchristian and hateful. You know, may, maybe there was somebody who who did treat you this way, and let's talk about that rather than you know casting a whole church body in that in that that light. You know, but some people are just content to do that. You know. Yeah, well, it's all hidden in, like, strict. You know, they aren't going to tell you, oh, you Missouri Sin people are a bunch of hateful, unloving people. They're not going to, probably not going to say that. Yeah, yeah. But they'll say, oh, you guys are the strict Lutherans, you know. We are accepting. We are open to accepting everybody uh, who yes, believes right. in Jesus and repents of their sins and wants to be forgiven. Yeah, and it usually it usually is yeah. having to do with holy communion. Yeah. And therefore, we're judgmental. Yeah, that yeah that comes back to that, but that also has to do with uh, you know with closed communion. You know, uh, Saint Paul says that you you cannot partake. Of the table, of the Lord, the cup of the Lord, and the cup of demons, right? Uh, and so, uh, there is an aspect in which, when we commune here, uh, we are repenting of any, we are renouncing and repenting of any association with false teaching. You know, uh, that we make a distinction between there's stuff that's true and there's stuff that's false, and I don't want to have anything to do with what is false, right? Uh, and insofar as I've given into that, I ask that the Lord would forgive me. You know, hence why I'm here, right? So there, so there is some of that. There is that distinction. You know, and we still do this, right? Because what does John do before the distribution there? 
right? And do you know where that comes from in the history of the church? Maybe not just our, but the church in, in, as a whole. Do you know where that comes from? So in the early eras of the church, you know, uh, babies were baptized, but also there were a lot of adult converts, much more than, than we have now, of course. Uh, and confirmation, even for the adults, was you know, for three years. And so when it came to the Sunday service, everybody would come to the service. But then when it got to the service of the sacrament, uh, the deacon would go, the doors, the doors. And those who were still in the catechumenate, uh, they were dismissed uh, at that point to go continue their study, and the doors were closed so that the only people who were there for the service of the sacrament were uh, baptized, confirmed Christians. I don't know. Or is it just the fact they didn't want to sit through communion? <laughs> Probably the second one. I don't know. Yeah. You know, uh, I always love that when I go to Mass and how, like, people, they go up to receive Mass and they just keep walking down the aisle back, <laughs> back out the back door. I always love that, you know. We could leave that door open, actually. We could. I mean, it doesn't really make, make it, you know. We, it's not like we're bursting at the seams with visitors. You know, um, but in the early church, yeah, that really was that really was a thing. Like they had a, a good population of the congregation that, that was not confirmed yet, and so like that was taken so seriously that if you were not a baptized, if you were not a catechized member of the congregation, you were you were dismissed at that point. You know that so they took that very seriously. You so know, why is it that? Is it I probably, I don't know. He's just always done that. I don't know when it started. It's just been that way since I've been here. Do you want me to tell John to leave it open? I don't care. It's by now it's traditional. <laughs> yeah, I know. But I mean why would we do things that are tradition that we that maybe we don't even know why we do them? Maybe we should ask John why he does it. See he's not watching this probably. So Yeah, and this I mean it's not um It does have the I'm not getting yeah. into God's face, but no. I think Yeah. Uh, Things that are indifferent. And, yeah. And tradition. Yeah. I think it has the, the added aspect of, you know, were somebody to come in at that point, you know, there would be uh, something to pause, give them a moment of reflection before they just barge right in. You know, it, it maybe has that, that point. Um, and does that closed door announce that it's post communion? Is that? I don't know why we do it, it's just something we do. I'm just the pastor. We were, Grace was doing it before I got here, so in that well, case. Yeah, I think it's always been done. So I was just thinking, so why do we do that? I mean, Ask about it sometime later, yeah. you know. Um, you know, what you know, signifies closed communion is, you know, when somebody comes and I don't know who they are and then I don't commune them, you know, that's, that's closed communion, you know. Um, but you handle them very nicely. I try to, you know. Right. Yeah, I try not to. You know, it's ultimately it's my, it's what I'm called to do. It's not what the, the elders are elected to do, right? Um, you know, and I try to be and okay I about say, it. I, I just know because John's been trying mm -hmm. to build this box for yeah. church workers. Yeah. And I just know there's a few people who won't touch her because they don't yeah. want to say, you can't take communion. Yeah, yeah, well, and my response is just send them up. You know, I'm like, just, just send them up, you know, and, you know, that's, that's fine with me. I mean, that's part of why I get paid big bucks is to have people not like me. So, um, you know, but I try to be okay about it. Like, you know, if somebody comes up, and you've seen me do this several times, you know, of, if I don't know who somebody is, I'll ask them who they are. And, you know, uh, if they're visiting us from another Missouri Synod congregation, you know, uh, if yes, then... Would you like to join us for the Lord's Supper today? And, and if no, or I don't know, or you know, some other answer other than yes, I'm coming from another Missouri Synod congregation, I'll be like, well, I'll be okay if I give you a blessing today. Then, then we can talk more yeah, after church. Yeah. You know. Um, well, I have yet to take communion over at our Redeemer where Jeff goes. 
Mm -hmm. uh, <laughs> well, number one, we get there at the last minute. Mm -hmm. So I don't have a chance to talk to the minister. Yeah. Another option would be, you know, call him or send him an email saying, hey, just a heads up, uh, you know, I'm going to be here, you know, with my daughter, you know, comes here regularly, you know, that sort of thing. Some sort of contact, you know, and, um, you know, it's just it's a different way of doing things. You know, I typically don't, the only people who, who regularly get irritated with me uh, on this topic would be ELCA Lutherans uh, who, come, who come to our congregations and want to commune, and then when I, you know, when they'll say, um, I'm a member at St. John's Bennington, you know, not a Missouri Synod congregation. And so I said, well, you know, I'm, I'm very happy to have you here with us today and, and, uh, and joyful to have you pray and, and worship with us. So would it be okay if I give you a blessing today since I'm, unfortunately our church bodies are not in fellowship? And so then I'll do, but I can just see it. They're irritated with that, you know. And, that, and that's been my experience here and, and in North Dakota uh, because in their mind, Lutheran is Lutheran is Lutheran is Lutheran. And we say, well, I wish that were the case. I, I really do. And maybe someday it will, but right now it's not. Um, so. We worship the uh, evangelical Synod of Lake on Sunday. Mm -hmm. um, they have a card that you can you put mm -hmm. all your information on it. And one side is for members. Yeah. The other side is um, for those who wish to commune. But you also list what your church is. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I always find, I know we have to be done, but um, I always find, like, especially in that situation, I find communion registration cards, um, I don't know, maybe you guys, do, I would find them intimidating um, in the sense that the pastor is called to administer the Lord's Supper, uh, to admit you know, those to the Supper who should commune, uh, to not admit those who shouldn't be communed, uh, but with re communion registration cards, that responsibility is passed to me, you know, to the individual. And, and there is, like St. Paul says, that an individual should examine himself. Uh, but to me, if I were a layperson, I think, I think that would be intimidating because, you know, then say you're coming from an, a not a Lutheran church, you know, and then you get this card, you know, and you see people filling it out and you fill it out. And, and maybe people just don't think about it. They just fill it out and do it, and, you know. Yeah. Right. And we our yeah, I just I have I have I grew up in a congregation that has has communion registration cards. Um, and the one thing that it was helpful for was on the other side, it had a spot for prayer requests. Um, and, and the way that my congregation did it growing up was, you would put these in the plate during the offering, and then the elders would pick through it quick and they look for any that had prayer requests, and those those would get an elder would bring those up to pastor before the prayer of the church. And I thought that was really really useful. Very. Oh, yeah, I mean, and, and I, I, we should be done, so we'll, we'll maybe put a pin in this. I think um, the, my last word on, on like larger congregations, I think, um, you know, that's a part for, you know, pastor to, to lean on the elders, um, at least initially, um, because initially, like, you get a new pastor, you're called to a congregation, and there's 300 on Sunday at the, at the Lord's Supper. Um, you might not recognize everybody, so you're going to count on the elders, but after time, uh, well, the pastor should know everybody's names, uh, at the very least, by recognizing their faces, who, who, who is normally here and who is not. Um, and so I, I commonly get that. Well, well, what about the big churches? And, and that argument just doesn't work with me. It, it just, you know, being a pastor myself, like, uh, it would be my job to, if not know exactly who these people are, to at the very least know their faces. And if I don't, uh, have a good trust with my elders to say, you know, I'm not going to recognize everybody, but you have been members here for your whole lives. You are going to, you know, and let's develop some sort of sign uh, that, you know, we, we, can, we can work together uh, in our care for this congregation. So, like, that was one that was commonly, when I was in North Dakota, this, this was a very, a very big issue 
Um, and and that, was, that was like the number one, well, what about the big congregations, Pastor? If the big congregations, if, if that pastor communes everybody, what's your problem, Pastor Swenson, for not communing everybody? You know, are you saying that pastor's wrong? That, would, that was almost always like the second question. was like, are you saying this pastor who's been a pastor longer than you've been alive, that he's wrong? You know, at which point they're set, it's a trap. It's a trap question. You know, and there's not a simple like, you know, because then if I say he's wrong, you know, then, then I'm wrong. You know, because I've spoken against this beloved pastor. And, and so there's just no right way to answer that. Uh, so anyway, we better, we better be done. I know Pam's got to go. She looks like she's ready to leave. I was just going to say that again. Yeah. <laughs> I don't know if I remember this correctly, but it seems like somewhere in the past it was used by the Italian and the very Italian church. Mm. Mm-hmm. Yep. Yeah, so there are congregations that do that, so I'll throw Rich and Cheryl under the bus because they're not here. Um, a couple weeks ago, they went to uh, Rockwell City, to Rich's home congregation, and they communed there, and so I got a, their communion card in the mail. Um, and there's a couple members of St. John's that regularly go up to Wisconsin um, and commune at, at a congregation there, and they also do that. Um, so... Um, I do that, um, so at, every now and then at, here we'll have, like, uh, like Doris's sister and, and brother-in-law, I'll, I'll email over there, yep, uh, and then um, and at St. John's, um, there is a, a woman who works in Fairbank on Sundays, but she's a member at, a, at another local, you know, congregation, um, and so I, I kind of clue that pastor, and like, just... Heads, heads up, you know, this member of yours has been, been commuting here because uh, they work here in Fairbank on Sundays and they're able to get out and, and come. And uh, he was aware of that. He, you know, the, the two of them had talked already. But so I, I do that. I don't like send the communion card in the mail because we don't. Um, but, but I'll talk to contact those pastors and say, hey, just so you know, um, I had one of your members here, you know, on Sunday and, and I communed them and we were happy to have them. And, you know, let me know if I can be of any more service. So, yep, that still, that still goes on. Yep. All right. Well, we are going to be, this is maybe a record. How many questions did we do? One, two, three, four, five. We were on question six. So this is more than we've covered in a long time. Just off the first page. Yeah, right. <laughs> right. We're cruising. So, uh, but for now, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go see Glenn. So that's probably where I'll be till, till confirmation time. But uh, for now, uh, let us end with prayer. We pray. Gracious God, our Heavenly Father, we thank you this day uh, for our opportunity to continue our study of your word, uh, even this, this difficult word to us in, in Revelation. Uh, we do confess, Lord, that we live amidst this fallen world uh, in, in which Babylon is, is continuing to, to allure people, uh, and at times we even feel the temptations ourselves. We ask that by your Holy Spirit uh, you would keep us wise to the, the designs of the devil, that uh, when faced with temptation, we would resist uh, with your word uh, and flee wholeheartedly to your mercy when, when we fall into temptation. We ask especially this day that you would continue to be with your servant, Glenn, uh, that as it seems uh, the time for him to depart uh, to your side is near. Uh, we ask that you would keep him uh, strong in faith, uh, especially in the promises that you made to him in his baptism, uh, that his sins are washed away. Uh, though he was once as scarlet, he has been made white as wool. Uh, Help us in our witness, uh, both to him uh, and to his family, uh, that through our words they might be comforted, uh, that the eternal life uh, awaits Glenn and also the promise of the resurrection. This we ask in your own most holy name. Amen.